one of the ways in which uh, detractors sometimes argue that argue against reforming private schools and trying to defend the status quo is to put forward supposed practical or financial obstacles. Robert alluded to this, telling us that reforms will cost too much money or otherwise somehow be too difficult to bring about. So in this report, which, which, are, which we're launching today on our website, we aim to try to give the lie to this fatalistic worldview, uh, and we consider six potential options for reform in what we think is a measured and realistic manner. Uh, in each case, what we do is we first consider the principle of the reform, how far, if it was carried out, it would help to bring about a fairer and more efficient education system. Then we go through the various practical issues involved, in some cases uh, more crucial than others. And finally, we set out as far as we can, the financial implications of that reform, especially for the taxpayer and the chancellor. In most cases, it's possible to give a good approximate estimate of how much each policy will either cost the exchequer or how much extra tax revenues it would bring in, uh, 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 which could then be added to the budget for state schools. So let me go through this option very quickly. The first option is to tax school fees at 20%, which was the, actually the uh, in, in Labour Party's uh, last manifesto, <coughs> tax them at 20% or 25%, that would give, uh, bring in about 1.8, between 1.8 and 2.2 billion pounds, which amounts to 4 or 5% of the state school's budget. The second option, similar, is to remove all the tax benefits from charitable status, which would similarly bring in, we calculate, upwards of 2 billion pounds. The third option, uh, often canvassed, is to reinforce and scale up what's called contextual admissions uh, to universities and possibly also contextual recruitment to jobs, particularly public sector jobs. That is giving preferences and additional support to pupils from low income backgrounds. Now any or all, or all of those first three options would bring about a squeeze on the private schools market diminishing the size of the sector, though with the risk, admittedly, that the remaining ones who go to those private schools, the remaining ones will be yet more socially exclusive. The next two options, we're now on options four and five, these are the most radical. Partial integration with the state school system, we call that the fair access scheme, which is what David Kiniston and myself, we set out for the first time in, in our book. In these options, the aim is to integrate the private school, the private sector, into the state sector directly. Sorry, I should have said that the fourth option was the fair access scheme, and the fifth option is essentially the complete phasing out of private schools, sometimes called nationalisation, sometimes called abolition. And those last two options differ in primarily their extent and the pace of integration that the key thing is their integration of the two sectors to some degree or other. Under the Fair Access Scheme, one third initially of the new intake at all primary and secondary schools would become free state school places funded by the government at the same age appropriate rate that they fund everybody else. Schools would become partly private, partly state schools. The criteria for allocating <coughs> the state school places will be determined by government and there would be no increase in selection, academic selection. Two minutes, Francis. Right. So I'll skip over that, that little bit. With nationalisation, by contrast, by phasing out private education altogether and absorbing all pupils into the mainstream state system, this country would be able to offer all its children a fair chance in life. Under either of these two options for integration, the schools will, after some years of phasing it, become very much more open. And the resource gap between schools will be reduced and even closed. The reforms will then become part of the new educational landscape, not to be reversed by future governments, like the taxes could be. And all parts of our society, all parts of our society will acquire a stake in the education of all our children. Our final option for reform, and I must have time to say this, is a far less radical one, but nonetheless important one, 
And we've called it from reform from within. Some progressive state school leaders, unhappy with the present situation, aware of this social exclusivity, have told us that they aim to try to raise sufficient endowments from wealthy alumni to produce enough full bursaries to substantially open their schools to all comers. Now, we think that's going to be a very challenging task. The 1% has been mentioned already, and it's just been the same 1% for some years now. There's not been much change for the last decade. But nonetheless, it's, it's an option which worth, is worth, worthy of consideration. Let me just sum up in my remaining seconds. What we have in this short report is a list of options for reform with the main principles and practicalities laid out. It is not, repeat, not a manifesto. We are not aiming, we're not sort of saying go for this one option or another. It's like a, a sort of do it yourself, pick and choose, which is there for you to read and make up your mind about. And we've also sent it to all the leaders of all the main political parties for the same thing. One thing, however, I am sure of, that it will be a shame, a tragedy even, to let pass another opportunity for phasing down or phasing out or whatever Britain's exclusive private schools. Thank you.